So we're now authenticated on the Wi-Fi network Paddington. The first thing we'll do is do a recon of the network using Nmap. Nmap quote unquote is used to discover hosts and services on a computer network by sending packets and analyzing the responses. Nmap provides a number of features for probing computer networks. Nmap can assist in the discovery of vulnerabilities on a network host by scanning the services used by a particular port. To break this down, Nmap is the service I want to use. Dash ST is the type of scan I want to perform. I then specify the network IP address of 192.168.1.0 and then WAC or backslash 24. 24 is the subnet mask and on this network it's 255.255.255.0. So I can see that the Nmap scan is now starting. The scan I've just done on Nmap is the TCP connect scan. This completes the three-way handshake to provide me with the results that you see on screen. This is referred to as a loud scan because a packet analyzer may see multiple three-way handshake requests coming from a single IP address. So if we look in Wireshark here, we can see that my device has sent a SYN packet to the host on the network. The host has then replied with a SYN ACK and then my device has replied back with an ACK. This is the three-way handshake being completed. Before we go any further, let's explain briefly what the TCP three-way handshake is. TCP three-way handshake establishes a reliable connection between the client and a web server. The client first sends a SYN or synchronized packet to the web server. The web server then responds with a SYN ACK or synchronized acknowledge packet. The client then responds back to the web server with a ACK or an acknowledge packet. Then the three-way handshake is completed. If we want to go under the radar of a potential IDS or an intrusion detection system, Nmap can do what's called a stealth scan. The stealth scan is where the client sends a SYN packet to the web server. The web server then responds with a SYN ACK packet, but the client doesn't respond back as it's left the conversation, but has now the information that's required to display the results on the screen. The server will then see there's been no response and the connection will be reset. So we'll use Nmap again. We'll do Nmap dash SS and 192.168.1.0, which is network address slash 24, which is the network prefix. The scan I've used is what's commonly known as a stealth scan. So from the results here, I can see there's a device on 192.168.1.1.10.11.13. So 192.168 is shown as a Draytec device on the network. 1.1 is normally where the router would sit. So I can guess that this is probably going to be a Draytec router. I can see that port 80 is open, which also means it's going to have some sort of web server or web interface enabled. 192.168.1.10 is another Draytec device. This could potentially be a network switch or a wireless access point. And then we've got 192.168.1.13, which is by Hikvision, which is a security camera company. I can see ports 80, 8000 and 554 are open. Port 554 is the real-time streaming protocol. This is what security cameras usually use to stream the live view of their footage. If I go back to Wireshark after my Nmap stealth scan, I can see there's been a SYN or synchronized packet been sent, but no SYN ACK. So therefore the connection has been reset, acknowledged. So back in Nmap, after I've done my scan, I can see there's a device on 192.168.1.1, which is a Draytech device, which I assume is going to be a router. So let's go to that web page. We're now on the web UI of the Draytech router. So if this has been a poorly set up network, I could try the Wi-Fi password again straight away. So I could try admin and buster123. So the router admin password isn't the same as the Wi-Fi password. So there's been an added layer of defense on this network. So let's brute force. To get the admin password and gain access to this router, I'll be using a utility called Hydra. Hydra is a brute force system which allows me to use a word list of passwords against a login name such as admin. So I'll be using Hydra-L admin dash P and then specify the location of my word list that I'm going to use to brute force and the IP address of the router. And I'm using the secure shell or SSH connection to that router. So what I've basically done here is use the service dash L, which is login admin, and then the dash P is the password list that I wish to use. So I can see here that the router's password has been cracked. And the login is admin and password is let me in with an exclamation mark. Let's go back to the web UI of the router and try admin and let me in exclamation mark and we're in. So from here we can see the ISP's WAN address so we can see who the ISP, the company or the residence is with. We can also download the 
configuration file from the router, factory reset the router if wanted to, which could cause a catastrophic major problem for any company that's got a big network on this router. We can remove any sort of VPN details, so any connection from the outside to this router will be impossible. But the main issue a company could face if an attacker was to gain access to their router was to do any DNS poisoning. DNS, or the domain name system, is a service that translates human readable words into IP addresses. For instance, if I do a ping to Amazon.com, I'll get a reply from the web server that I'm communicating with. This is because networks don't understand human readable text. They use IPv4 decimal and IPv6 hexadecimal addresses to find a location on the web that the request is being sent to. If I type in 1.1.1.1, it will take me to Cloudflare. So we use DNS, otherwise we would have to type in dotted decimal addresses every time we want to visit services such as Amazon or Facebook and it will soon become very monotonous and annoying. DNS poisoning is the act of an attacker changing the DNS IP and redirecting the user to their spoofed web server. For instance, if the router's DNS was poisoned, the victim could type in Amazon.com and be redirected to a spoofed version of that website that the attacker is hosting. From there, there could be keyloggers and phishing tactics enabled to steal any confidential information, as well as malware, which can be downloaded on any page the victim clicks on. So back once again to Nmap, and I mentioned there was a device running on 192.168.1.13 with ports 80, 8000 and 554 open. 554 is the real-time streaming protocol which security cameras normally use for their live stream of footage. So let's go to the IP address, and I'll try the root admin password. I could also brute force an IP camera, but a lot of IP cameras have brute force protection enabled by default, which will only allow you to log in, say, six times before the camera's locked for a certain amount of time. So we may have to find other ways to gain access to that camera by finding vulnerabilities or exploits online. I'll go to the IP address. And I'll see the web UI now. And I'm going to try the same password that I had for the router. So let me in, exclamation mark. And I'm in. From here, if this camera was one of many on a commercial premises, we could see if there's any blind spots anywhere or any motion detection settings within the camera itself. So we can go to configuration page because we're the admin of the camera and see any motion detection which we can disable so it won't trigger any sort of alarm in case an attacker wishes to perform a physical breaking on the building. If this camera was in a reception area of a building, for instance, an attacker could phone that company and pretend to be from a service which is within that reception area, such as a vending machine, a drinks machine or a water cooling machine, they could then say that that machine requires services, so could they have an email address to send the documentation over to be signed off by the receptionist? Once they download that documentation from the email, it can create a reverse connection back to the attacker and then they're in the network remotely. Another reason for attacking a Wi-Fi network is to steal confidential information by becoming a man in the middle. This usually happens on open Wi-Fi networks and a coffee shop or a library, but it can also happen on private networks as well. Man in the middle is where an attacker's machine intercepts network traffic between two hosts, such as a laptop communicating with a router, by redirecting the network traffic through the attacker's machine, thus being a man in the middle. By doing this, the man in the middle may be able to see in plain text confidential information the victim inputs into any sort of login form on a web page, especially if that web page is using an unsecure method such as HTTP. HTTP or the hypertext transfer protocol is a request and response protocol in the client server computing model as an example a client device such as a laptop or a smartphone using a web browser submits a http request to the web server hosting a website such as login credentials to a web account the server will then respond with the relevant resources and other content the response will also contain completion status information about the request such as a successful login or a failed login in the message body the issue of http is there's no encryption so any conflict information can be seen by an attacker in plain text. HTTPS is the secure version of HTTP and encrypts information between the client and the web server using TLS or transport layer security. This is sometimes referred to as HTTP over TLS. Inputting your confidential information on an insecure web page makes you very vulnerable to credential theft. Before I begin my man in the middle attack, let's look at the MAC address of the gateway router on my network. I need to go to my Windows machine and go to command prompt and type in ARP-A. So what is ARP? 
ARP is the Address Resolution Protocol. This protocol is what maps an internet protocol address or an IP address to a hardware address or MAC address of a device on the local area network. A unique IP address is assigned from the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol or DHCP server to establish identification and communication of a device on the local area network. When an incoming packet directed to a host on the local area network arrives at the gateway or the router, the gateway queries the ARP to match the IP address with the MAC address of that device on the local area network. A table called the ARP cache maintains a record of the IP addresses and its corresponding MAC address and updates when a new device on the LAN sends an ARP request to the gateway which will then be stored. I can see on my Windows machine that the gateway address is 172.16.16.1 and the hardware address of that router ends in 65E0. If I then start my man in the middle attack by using better cap, specify the interface LAN 0 and a caplet Caplet.cat. I'm now a man in the middle of the network. So if I go back to my Windows machine and type in ARP A, I can see that my router's IP address is still 172.16.16.1. However, the hardware address is now ended in F5C1. Therefore, means that my laptop is now a man in the middle on this network and is listening for data or traffic between two hosts on that network. So now to test I'm a man in the middle on this network, I've gone to vulnweb.com, which is an insecure website. Go to the login page. On the admin, I can type in a fake email. So banking email at yahoo.com and just input a fake password. If I go back to my man in the middle terminal, I can see that that information has been captured. So I can see in plain text, username, banking email, yahoo.com and the password was QWERTY UIOP. If the victim uses the same credential for multiple platforms or accounts, the attacker may also be able to access them accounts. But if you are using a HTTPS encrypted web page, well, the man in the middle can also downgrade HTTPS to HTTP. If the web page is using HSTS or HTTP strict transport security policies such as Facebook and Twitter, we can redirect the user to a genuine looking web page with a spoofed URL and an insecure connection. Before I start this attack, I'll go to a genuine web page such as netflix.com. From here, I can see we're using an encrypted connection, HTTPS, because of the padlock up on the search bar. And I can also see it's using netflix.com. If I now go to the login screen, again, I can see I'm on an encrypted connection on the genuine web page. If I now go back to my Linux machine and begin my man in the middle, so better cap, I face, land zero, caplet, caplet.cap. I'm now a man in the middle. I now use a tool called HSTS Hijack. So this is now downgrading any HTTPS to HTTP and any web pages that are using HSTS. It's redirecting the user to a web page which looks like .com but instead says .corn. I now go back to my Windows machine, do netflix.com. I can see I've been redirected to a not secure web page. And if we look at the URL, it's saying netflix.corn instead. Therefore, this is an unsecure web page. If I now go to the sign in, still say not secure and netflix.corn. If I go to put in some credentials, so my Netflix email at yahoo.com and put in a fake password. My man in the middle attack has now captured that information. So I can see here in plain text, my Netflix email at yahoo.com and password, super password, one, two, three, four, five, five. DNS spoofing is also a dangerous attack type. If the DNS is spoofed, we can then redirect the victim to a spoofed web page where credentials can also be captured. So on my screen, I have two identical Netflix web pages. One is genuine and one is fake. On the left hand side is the genuine Netflix.com web page. On the right hand side is the spoofed web page, which I made. My Linux machine has an Apache web server, which allows me to, as an example, host a web server on a local area network. I simply went to the genuine Netflix page, took some lines of HTML code, pasted it into my Apache server, started the server, and this is the result. So I'll go to my web server directory, 
open up the HTML document and just remove this code. And I'll just type in a simple line of text. This web page may look genuine, but may also be loaded with malware to install key loggers and Trojan horse viruses. I'll save that, close it. So I'll go to ebay.com and I can see here I'm on the genuine eBay website. I can see the secure web page up on the top left and ebay.com is in the URL search bar. Now if I start my Apache server and then start my man in the middle attack and now I want to spoof the DNS to redirect the victim to my web server. So I'll use the DNS spoof tool within BetterCap. So I'll do set DNS spoof all. It says a bit DNS spoof dot all. If true, the module will reply to every DNS request. Next one to do is set DNS spoof domains. And here I specify the domain that I want to spoof. So I'll do ebay.com, comma, and asterisk dot ebay.com. The asterisk means anything before dot ebay.com will also be spoofed as well. Then I'll do DNS spoof on. And that's starting the DNS spoof. So if I now go back to my Windows machine and go to www.ebay.com, it's now redirected me to my Linux machine saying this web page may look genuine, but it will also may be loaded with malware to install keyloggers and Trojan horse viruses. So this could also look like a genuine eBay web page. And once you log into your eBay account, it could then download malware, reverse connections to the attacker, or just steal your credentials. So how do you protect against these sort of attacks? It goes back to the basics of Wi-Fi security. Make sure your Wi-Fi password is complex and contains uppercase, lowercase, and special characters so that the attacker cannot gain access to that wireless network. Try and use different passwords for different accounts. If an account is compromised, it's less likely for an attacker to be able to use the same credentials to access another service. Always check the browser bar and the URL you've gone to. Make sure that the icon is showing a padlock to ensure that it's using a HTTPS encrypted connection and make sure the URL says the genuine web page such as ebay.com, twitter.com or facebook.com. Use Google to find the services you require, which will display the most popular websites first. So Twitter will always display Twitter first rather than a spoof version of that web page. A utility to use is XARP. XARP detects any potential spoofing activity and alerts the user that a spoof may be in progress. This video is made to help educate people and help them understand what can happen once an attacker gains access to a Wi-Fi network. Some of the attacks that they can perform, such as the man in the middle or DNS spoofing and redirecting web pages. So just always make sure that you're checking the URL search bars and always make sure you're using encrypted connections on the web pages you use.